Welcome to the interview section of another Talking Trash with TerraCycle. We've got some really exciting things to talk about today with our special guest, Mitch Hedlund, who is the Executive Director of Recycle Across America, who is a fast-growing and very influential nonprofit in the recycling space, as well as a TerraCycle partner. We've been working on some cool projects together uh, starting last year, and, and we have some exciting stuff coming up as well that we'll talk about. Mitch, thank you so much for joining us. Oh my gosh, Alvi, thank you for the opportunity. It's always a pleasure. So before we jump into how Recycle Across America and TerraCycle are working together, why don't you just tell us a little bit about your organization and, and why you are dedicating your life to making better standardized recycling labels? Yeah, absolutely. Well, thank you for that. Um, it's really quite simple. You know, there's um, a number of times in history where industries have been, for lack of a better term, plagued by confusion. And industries, whether it's railroad industry or, or medical industry or nutrition industry or even managing, you know, road traffic signs, um, you know, there's been times where confusion has affected the economics of an industry or public behavior or um, the efficiency of an industry. And at times in these industries, a standardization has come into play that has dramatically transformed that industry to make it more efficient, less confusing, less redundant, and usually more profitable. And when I had the opportunity about six years ago now to um, get very close to the recycling industry, I was witnessing from the general public experience how incredibly confusing recycling really is. And I think in general we all think that recycling is a well-oiled machine and that it's being done everywhere and that we're all doing it and doing it right. But the reality is, is that we are all confused by not only, you know, what is recyclable, but when we're out in public um, and even in our homes sometimes, there's a, a number of things that just are borderline recyclable or, or we're not quite sure, or um, just the way recycling is presented to us um, when we're out in public, it can tend to be very confusing. And so you and I and, and a good population, portion of the population really care and we're trying to figure it out, but the reality is there's a, a very large part of the population that begins to get skeptical because of the confusion with recycling. And as a result of that, um, there's literally millions of tons of garbage going into recycling bins every day. And that becomes very, because of that confusion, because of that contamination level, that becomes very expensive for the industry to process. Um, to make sure that uh, the bad things are being pulled out um, and the good materials are being sorted properly and are being marketed and resold for manufacturers to use. But when the system is confusing, it, it really starts to break down and it becomes inefficient and redundant and, and the products don't become marketable. Um, and so there's kind of this breakdown of the system. And so witnessing that, um, it just became very clear to me that this is an industry that's really right for having a standardized um, approach and how recycling is presented to the general public on the national level. And uh, so that was kind of the impetus of starting Recycle Across America and introducing a standardized labeling system for recycling bins so that the general public can know what they should do when they walk up to a bin um, without having to relearn the messaging at every single bin. So describe those labels to us. I, obviously, I've seen them a lot. We use them here at TerraCycle. Um, but so our listeners know what they're looking for and, and why they're so effective. I mean, I, I know some key things about them that make them so universal and so effective. But describe the label and, and why it is so effective in making people understand what can and cannot be recycled at that bin. Yeah, well, that's a great question. It's funny because when I started this, um, at the time, and this is still true, a lot of labels are... Um, in fact, you may not even see a label on a recycling bin. You might just see the chasing arrows, the three chasing arrows that we identify as recycling. Um, and people think, isn't that, doesn't that represent recycling? And it does to some degree, but it doesn't tell us what actually should go in that bin. And because every way of sorting is a little bit different from one recycling hauler to the next or one community to the next, a chasing arrow isn't enough information to let people know what should go in that bin. Um, so that's, that's kind of what we've known as recycling. That's one point of confusion. But for the businesses and schools and universities and airports and even homes, 
there's a different label. Um, if they are using a label, every label looks a little different. Um, some are text only, some are black and white only, some are blue, some, some might have a little bit more um, detail on them, but there's no consistency anywhere. And so when we started this, we wanted to really identify what could be the most effective for people. And the idea of photographs, very clear, simple photographs that represent what material should go in the bin um, was an obvious thing for us. And, and oddly, it wasn't really being done before. Um, so we really focused, made sure that the labels were very um, photocentric, with a lot of white space, very simple, very easy to look at. Um, but we also needed to go beyond that. We needed to make sure that there was a color coding system and that there was some language on there, but not too much language. So there was a lot of thought. It was a very methodical process to start developing what we identify as a standardized label. Um, and it couldn't be one size fits all because, as I said before, there's so many different haulers and municipalities asking people to recycle in different ways. So we actually had to create a gallery of labels that address each one of those sorting requirements. And it's worked. I mean, it's just been really remarkable that the color coding system that we chose and the simplicity of the language and the photos and the choice of labels that we've offered has been really effective. And that's been a great, a great thing for us to witness. Um, and then just on that note, it's really important to mention that even though we started this and we designed the labels, we made sure that um, industry leaders, about 40 different industry representatives, also looked at the labels before we launched and evaluated them and offered their feedback and their input. And then we went outside of the industry to also um, have students and general public and consumers and education leaders also evaluate the labels. So it wasn't just us coming out saying these work, but there was you know, good in input from all different types of parts of society also chiming in. And TerraCycle is proud to be part of that effort. We partnered with Recycle Across America for the first time last summer uh, to help promote the Let's Recycle Right social action campaign. And we helped promote that through our TV show, Human Resources, uh, which airs on the Pivot Network. And we'll be again this year uh, for season two. We'll be continuing to promote Let's Recycle Right and the uh, uh, Recycle Across America campaign in general. Tell us, Mitch, a little bit about you know what working with TerraCycle has been like, why you decided that TerraCycle was a company you could partner with, and, and what advantages you've seen from partnering both with Pivot, our media partner, and with TerraCycle ourselves. Oh, yeah. <laughs> well, this is, you know, there's probably in the last five years, five to six years that I started this, there's been some, for lack of a better word, pivotal moments where players have come in in the industry have come into our um, lives basically with Recycle Across America and just we couldn't have dreamt for better partners and I think that is exactly what we have with both TerraCycle and Pivot, Participant Media's Pivot. Um, a couple of things. Um, when Participant Media came to us and said we really believe in what you're doing and we want to partner with you and they introduced the show Human Resources to us, it was just such a magical bingo for um, having a media partner bring awareness to the subject of recycling um, and and do it in a way that's highly entertaining and very relevant for for you know the next generation and our you know all generations actually. But they did it in such a great way. So we have this great vehicle to piggyback on. But the other thing is TerraCycle is such a remarkable partner because your organization is doing, it's, it's, there's some irony to it. A TerraCycle is finding a way to recycle things that are most often not considered recyclable. And yet the way that you're doing it is so methodical, so controlled, so well done, that not only are you recycling these things that traditionally aren't considered recyclable, but you're doing it in a way where there isn't contamination, where you do have a market buyer. So there's, the irony of that is that we're working on really improving the industry and making it more profitable with less contamination for all the mainstream items that everybody thinks and knows should be recycled. But because of the dysfunction, it's not working very well. And your industry and your company is doing something so unique where you're doing all of the exact opposite of that. You're seeking things that clearly, you know, most people in the industry and outside of the industry would think that it's, it's landfill bound materials, and yet you're finding them 
and collecting them in a way where it's controlled and there's no contamination and you can capitalize on that. And that, to me, is a beautiful um, partnership and it's a brilliant, ironic story that should be told because as an industry for recycling mainstream consumer materials, we should look upon the model of TerraCycle to say if they can do that with the materials that are traditionally not considered valuable, what are we doing wrong with our industry when we know these materials are highly valuable? Um, what are we doing wrong with this industry that we can learn from TerraCycle's approach and, and do it right? Um, so it's, it's just, you know, I've known about TerraCycle, but I didn't know about TerraCycle as much as I do now, and I, I just think it's a great serendipitous partnership that came to us that I'm forever grateful for. Um, so, and there's many other things, of course, because we've been a benefactor of a lot of corporate partnerships that have that work with TerraCycle to recycle some of their packaging, and we've been the benefactor of the proceeds of that. And that, um, that full circle approach has not only gotten our corporate partners' products back into the system to be recycled, but it's brought funds to us through your program that allow us to give free standardized labels to public schools. And that you know, becomes a really great philanthropic effort of our corporate partners. So it's just this other kind of serendipitous um, full circle, closed loop partnership as well. No, I think that's part of what made Recycle Across America such a great partner for TerraCycle is you guys are figuring out ways to get people to recycle traditional recyclables more effectively and, and more often. And TerraCycle is trying to do the same, but focusing on less traditional recyclables or things that other people might call non-recyclable. So it, it really has been a, a serendipitous and, and fortuitous partnership so far. Yeah, great. I mean, honestly, if we master both of these, it's just it's a it's a game changer globally. You know, if if you're showing that your business model is highly profitable, you know, very creative, innovative, creating jobs. I mean, all of this kind of magical pixie dust that should be part of every new venture. You're doing that with those materials, and if we can get the mainstream recycling to correct which, as I said in the beginning of this, every industry has gone through, so many industries have gone through times where they, they needed, you know, something from a standardized element to help correct the industry and make it more profitable. If we can help get the industry to that level where recycling becomes very easy for the general public to do properly and there's less contamination and the profitability of processing those materials are, are healthier, um, you know, I mean, then we're, it's a beautiful, beautiful thing because as we all know, recycling has so many different layers of benefits environmentally and economically and waste going into oceans, you know, and CO2 levels. There's so many different areas that benefit when recycling is done right. Um, so it's, it's good use of all of our time, I think. I think we should all be proud in the direction that we're going um, and the things that we're working on. Absolutely. So let's jump into some of those uh, some of those industry issues. Now, Recycle Across America has been generally attacking some of the misnomers or, or half truths that have been put out there. And one thing that I really like that you guys have been talking about, that I'm constantly talking about, both professionally and personally, is that you know what is considered recyclable and what is valuable enough to recycle, and what our society throws away versus viewing as being reusable or recyclable is being dictated by private companies whose decisions are being made solely with profitability in mind. And that that is at the core of a lot of our challenges, is as long as we let private companies determine and what is or isn't recycled by communities that we're never going to be able to really break through to a much more sustainable society. So in a recent newsletter that you guys put out, you looked at some of these statements that are, are half true or, or in some case less than half true. I'd like to raise some of these things and then have you, Mitch, tell our listeners a little bit about you know, what, where the, the kernels of truth are there and, and what are outright lies and, and what we can do to try to overcome some of these things. Does that sound good? Yeah, absolutely. All right, so the one is is uh, mixed recycling or, or what people can call single stream or single sort 
recycling. And uh, a lot of private companies, and I don't want to name or shame anyone specifically here, but a lot of major waste management type companies are claiming that this is uh, contaminating the recycling system and is making recycling non-profitable and that single stream recycling will actually be the death of recycling. Tell us a little bit about why that isn't the case or shouldn't be the case. Right. Well, it's really ironic not to throw that word out again, but it is um, because a lot of the major haulers really started the idea of mixed recycling and with good intention, I think. Um, when that first was introduced, the idea was let's get to the point where more people are recycling more which that sounds fabulous, you know, make it easier for people just to start recycling more. And there's there's a couple of different um, evolutions that's happened in recycling. There was a time that you are all young, so you may not remember this as much, but when I was very young, um, recycling meant that we actually went to a facility where everything was very separated. Every bin was dedicated for one particular material. And um, anybody who cared about recycling and had access to one of these drop-off centers would go, and they were. It was very clear what you did at each bin. So your newspaper went in one, your brown glass went in another. Plastic, if it was being collected at that time, was going in another bin, and it was very clear what type of plastic um, and aluminum cans and metal cans in another. So even though the U.S. at that time probably wasn't recycling very much because that infrastructure wasn't in place to pick it up at the end of your driveway, um, and you were only getting a small percentage of the population that had access or used these drop-off centers, the reality was is, is that probably was the most pure time of recycling because the people that were going to that effort were doing it and everything was source separated and it was the contamination level at that time was probably pretty low. But from that point forward, when recycling became something that was at our um, household driveways or at our businesses, and it was being collected in other places, things started to change. And, and in a way, they came out so disorganized that it did a disservice, I think, to the industry. So um, every community started doing things a little bit differently. The haulers or municipalities didn't think of kind of a broad stroke approach to how to make recycling comprehensive for the general public. So each hauler and each municipality invented their own way of um, not only how things could be sorted at the homes or businesses, but how things would be presented, what labels would look like, what instructions would look like. And from there, um, we went from having bins at the end of our driveway to all of a sudden this mixed system. And the idea was, where it's been introduced, the idea was that, well, now we'll get the public to start recycling more and we'll make it super easy for them to put everything, all the recycling in one bin together. And, and that's where it, the system became degraded a little bit more because it just... Uh, what could go in that bin was not always really well communicated to the general public. Um, permeable materials were, were asked to be thrown in with non-permeable materials. And I think the industry was proud because they could say that, you know, more recycling was being collected, but the way that it was presented to the general public was still confusing as far as what could actually go in that mixed recycling bin. So not only was paper and cardboard a victim of being thrown in the same bin with a soup can with noodles, but there was no clear national society-wide information as far as what else should be happening in that bin, you know, um, which types of plastics truly are recyclable or aren't recyclable. Um, and the industry now, years later, is saying that this mixed recycling, and this is the industry that also wanted this to come out, um, the mixed recycling, but now they're saying the mixed recycling is really the victim of recycling not being profitable. And there is some truth to that because there is a contamination, you know, issue with, as I said, a soup can that all on, fall onto, you know, the newspaper and contaminate the newspaper. But the lack of communication on a national level that is that really helps the general public know what truly is recyclable, which plastics truly can go in that bin. There's been such a lack of consistent information coming out about the do's and don'ts of recycling. And there isn't anything that's consistent about recycling anywhere you go, including how bins are labeled. Um, and there's been no national communication to even talk about recycling properly to the general public. So you've got this perfect storm of a system that brings a little level of contamination to it, but it's, 
it's the bigger issue is that the general public hasn't been instructed on why they should recycle right or how to recycle properly. So is mixed recycling a good solution? No, it's not. Um, you know, paper and cardboard are the victim when they're thrown in with, with Coke can or some other products. But that isn't really just a huge, the huge issue is because of all the confusion, people are putting everything, including trash, dirty diapers, hypodermic needles, food waste, batteries, all sorts of things into recycling bins today because there's just this rejection of recycling being confusing and people start to become apathetic. Um, they start to be frustrated and a lot of people start to become skeptical. And I hear it every day. People say, I think I kind of think it's going to the landfill anyway. And so they throw on a dirty diaper. And um, so that's a very long-winded question that probably is hard to decipher, but recycling, mixed recycling, the idea in theory was good to increase recycling participation, but the way that it was actually presented to the general public has been, the way recycling in general has been presented to the general public has been just the invitation for high levels of contamination of things that clearly don't belong in the recycling stream, and that is the issue that we're addressing with the standardized label um, to bring down that confusion, to project to the general public that recycling is important, recycling right is critical, um, and we need some society-wide standardized tools to help the general public know that, that recycling right is critical enough to have that type of communication at that level. So, uh, other than the standardized labels and, of course, the, you know, recycling, opportunity, recycling opportunities, what are some things that we can do as a society, as individual consumers or as consumers as a whole, what are some things that we can do to try to drive up the stagnant recycling rates? Because while there might be a lot of myths going around, one thing is for sure is that recycling rates are not growing at the rate that they once were. So, what is it that we consumers, consumers to recycle better and, and, frankly, to recycle more? Yeah. Well, I think um, the first is to really understand that we have to recycle right. Um, recycling is highly critical on so many levels, environmentally on, on so many levels, economically it creates jobs. And the manufacturers, despite what we might think, they truly want these materials back. They want to be able to reuse these materials. So the most important message I think we can deliver to anybody um, on a consumer front is it is critical that we recycle right. Um, recycling and just putting more in a bin and not knowing if it's actually recyclable, that, that actually isn't serving anyone well. Um, so from the consumer standpoint, if you're confused about something, and I know this, this goes against a lot of people's belief, but if you're not sure if it's actually recyclable, throw it out, at least for right now. When the materials that you absolutely know are truly recyclable, make sure that they always get recycled. And if you're in question about it, you know, whether it's styrofoam or, you know, dirty napkin or something or pizza in a pizza box, if you're questionable, put it in the trash bin. Um, but the materials that are highly, highly recyclable without question, always make sure that they're being captured. Um, unfortunately, because of all the confusion, the bat baby is getting thrown out with the bathwater. I mean, even amazing materials like aluminum that are never in question, they're always highly recyclable, highly valuable, you know, most demanded in the marketplace by manufacturers. So, so millions of those are going to landfill every day still. Um, we have to get to the point where none of those high-quality materials ever go to landfill. And once we now have them, let's start bringing in some of the other materials that, you know, have, a, have an opportunity in the next round to become recyclable. So a lot of people will, will point towards more government involvement, financial incentives, uh, you know, uh, taxing and uh, packaging taxes and, and uh, taxing or fining for non-recyclable packaging, rising recycling, recycling companies are, are sort of the, the golden ticket for fixing our recycling industry. But upon closer look, that might not be the whole story. Tell us a little bit about why government involvement and subsidization and financial incentives could help but aren't going to be enough. Yeah, absolutely. I think it's it's a great, great point to bring up. It's easy to default and say, okay, well, recycling is not profitable right now and just talk about the contamination because of mixed recycling or to talk about where the current oil prices are. 
um, you know, to talk about virgin commodity pricing being so low that recycling can't compete with that. Again, that's kind of a half-truth. The reason that recycling prices in those commodities can't compete is because the cost of processing out all the garbage, the dirty diapers, all the things that don't belong in there, drives the price up so much of processing that the margins and the ability of recycling those in those recycling commodities become very narrow. So by the time you have virgin commodity pricing fluctuating, and, and dropping, like we're, what we're seeing right now with the oil pricing, then instantly recycling becomes a victim of that. And again, because of the contamination being such a huge issue, the cost of dealing with that contamination and trying to get it out of the recycling stream is a thing that's truly eating up the margins of the recycling process. So, so it's a victim um, because of that contamination. If the industry talks about needing subsidization or maybe higher um, fees from their customers or government um, incentives or something, that actually still doesn't fix the contamination issue. Um, the only way that recycling is going to become truly more profitable is if you can get cleaner materials coming in to the bin. Um, from the consumer, and the only way that you can do that is by helping the general public and the consumer, helping them recycle right. So stopping the contamination from ever going into the bin. And it's a common sense solution that can dramatically start to transform the economics in the processing and behind the bin and make those materials, those commodities, more profitable and more desirable by manufacturers. Um, but by having any type of financial incentive or penalty or subsidization by the government um, or increasing service fees, that doesn't actually deal with the contamination issue that's plaguing and ruining the economics of recycling right now. So, um, you know, I I'm not saying that that shouldn't be part of the equation, but I think it would be ridiculous to default to that right now um, when, when it's really the contamination, the general public's confusion with recycling that needs to be addressed. That's the source of what makes recycling less profitable. And so what else might you want our listeners to know or, or, or learn about or become interested in that I, that I haven't asked about yet? Yeah, I think, um, well, for, from a consumer standpoint and the general public standpoint, I guess the takeaway would be, Recycling, first of all, it's, it's better than good in theory. It, it's great if it's done properly. And we have the ability as a society and as a species to start living within a system again. Um, the infrastructure for recycling exists. The general buy-in for recycling is highly well received. Everybody loves the idea of it. As the general public, first of all, I want to acknowledge that I understand we're all confused when we walked up to a bin and we're not quite sure what should be recycled and what shouldn't, and we're guessing sometimes. So it's not the general public's fault that the contamination levels are so high. Um, but the first, I think, approach to fixing the problem is, first of all, letting the general public know that recycling is highly critical, but we have to do it properly. And give as much thought as you can when you're at the bin on whether what you're putting in that bin is truly recyclable or not. And if it's not, I hate to say it, but put it in the trash for now. Just make sure all the good things are going in the bin. The second is stay away from plastic bags. Um, they don't belong in the recycling bin loose. Um, they can damage equipment. They can make the processing very expensive. Um, and when you can avoid using plastic bags in general, um, they're, they're the first thing to blow out of the landfill. They end up in trees. They end up in waterways. Um, they end up in sea life. And they're, they're just tremendous, creating tremendous havoc. So as a behavioral thing, you know, I think that would be the, the thing that needs to be communicated as well to the general public is, you know, it's, you can recycle them if you're using them at a grocery store that allows for that type of recycling center. But um, try to keep it out of the recycling bin. And better yet, try not to use them at all. Um, and then ask your community if, if uh, they will start considering using the standardized labels in your school and your workplace, um, and, and let's help move the labels out farther faster because they are working. They are starting to eliminate confusion at the bin. 
um, and that can make a tremendous difference on the economics of recycling. And that right there is some expert level trash talking from Mitch Hedlund, the Executive Director of Recycle Across America. Mitch, before we let you go, I do have one question that we ask all of our guests. It's our little tough end of interview surprise question. And that is, what, share with our, our listeners your eco confession. What is the one thing that you don't do enough of or wish that you didn't do or just one bad eco habit that you either haven't been able to learn or haven't been able to drop? Oh my gosh. Um, good question. Let me think about this. I think probably, um, I mean, there's, I am, I, I am not a plastic water bottle person at all. I mean, I'm really struggling. I have serious sip guilt if I ever am holding a plastic water bottle that's been purchased. And I know often when I'm traveling, I always think don't, don't forget my water bottle, um, my, my metal water bottle when I travel because you know, you get into the airport and so forth, and your options are limited. And when you get on the flight, you're limited um, if you don't have a reusable bottle. And I know I'm not always good about that. So I, I travel quite a bit, and I deal with that water <laughs> plastic bottle guilt. And the only way that I overcome that is usually by the time I come home, I unload my uh, suitcase of all the, any of the, if I've had any plastic water bottles um, that I've accumulated at the airport or on my flight. Um, and, uh, and on that note, that's the other thing. I think we all have as consumers a huge opportunity to influence businesses that we support with our money, whether it's an airline or, or a coffee shop or anything. The other thing I would ask you on that note is just as consumers, ask businesses, whoever you're giving your money to, do they recycle and will they start to um, consider creating a recycling program in their building. Currently, it's, this is kind of unwritten, but it's it's what we've researched with the EPA um, through phone conversations. Currently, less than 10% of businesses in the U.S. recycle. And that's, I think as consumers, if we care about this subject, that's where we get to kind of use a little bit of our muscle to say that we want these businesses to start a recycling program and make it available to us wherever we are. And I think that is a great suggestion and confession, admittedly, and if it makes you feel any better, Mitch, as someone who also travels a lot for business, I find myself, the, the thing that always gets me is the disposable coffee cup, because I always have a reusable coffee cup in my car on the way to the airport, and I rarely manage to actually take it with me, and then I end up stuck with a, you know, some sort of to-go coffee cup, and I always feel terrible about it. I know, it's serious guilt. And if you're, I mean, I think that's the other thing for all of us is to realize we're not one. In the U.S., we're one of 300 million. So if we're doing this and everybody's doing this, what does that actually mean? And so we have to kind of think in a multiplier constantly. You know, if everybody does exactly what I'm about to do right now, is the world going to be a better place? Is it neutral or is it going to be worse? And that's a really good way to kind of go forward and say, okay, I have to remember that you know, I'm doing this, and I, what do I wish I would do to do something right, and what would I wish that everybody around me would also choose to do? And if we all did these little steps, it does make a huge difference. We have that ability. Um, we're not one. We're one of 300 million. We have the ability to affect change once you kind of scale it up a bit. So anyway, Albie, thank you so much for this opportunity. What a pleasure. Thank you, Mitch. And anyone out there that wants to learn more about Mitch's organization, Recycle Across America, it's very easy. You just go to RecycleAcrossAmerica.org. And also make sure to check out the upcoming Season 2 premiere of TerraCycle's show, Human Resources, which airs Friday, August 7th at 10 p.m. on the Pivot Network. And you'll see all sorts of integration of Recycle Across America and their labels, which we proudly use here at TerraCycle. Thanks again, Mitch. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Take care. What an amazing interview and some very important things to discuss. There are so many different opinions and ideas and all sorts of ways to look at recycling. And so it's really important that we standardize it, that we reduce the pollution rate in our recycling, and that we find ways to encourage more people to recycle more of the time. So a big thanks to Mitch 
for coming out and sharing her story and information about Recycle Across America. If you want to learn more about Recycle Across America, or you want to learn more about TerraCycle, or you want to see those Recycle Across America labels in action, make sure to check out the Season 2 premiere of Human Resources this Friday, August 7th at 10 p.m., only on Pivot. That's all for this episode of Talking Trash. We hope you enjoy the TV show, and we'll be talking more trash with you real soon. Thanks, from David and Albie.